warm welcome to all the participant for this webinar so as you have seen the program agenda so we have scheduled this meeting for 2 hours we request to please all the participant to keep their microphone on muted and the videos on muted unless they are speaking and uh, you know sharing some information so the objective and purpose of this webinar so this is a core objective of ahp to share the knowledge disseminate the knowledge and have a knowledge exchange on the topics of avian health and on the topics of disease management now we see the overarching objective why this is so important for us because you see avian health and disease management is critical for a sustainable food production sustainable food production and the poultry production poultry plays a very significant role in ensuring the contribution towards sustainable development goal the first sustainable development goal number 1 no poverty so the poultry provides a, a very sustainable economical way of you know farmers to produce and to have good livelihood more so ever sdg number 2 zero hunger so why virtue of sustainable poultry production eggs and chicken we are contributing to the food security and nutrition security of our country every 16 second we add up one more person to our population and we are a population of 1.42 billion which is every second is adding one more person so these people needs to be fed at least twice a day so from where this food security will come one of the key element is to have a sustainable poultry production in terms of chicken in terms of egg we all know uh, we are being among the top 5 countries on the uh, on the global ranking for the chicken production but very recently very heartening to share we have top the number 2 rank for the egg production so this speaks about our focus on the global map and why the role of poultry veterinarians is becoming more and more critical to ensure the sustainable food production more so ever sdg number 3 good health and well being we all have understood that role of animal protein like chicken and the eggs how it is important for ensuring good health and well being more so ever the important topic is around sustainability poultry production as compared to other animal agriculture has the lowest carbon footprint if you see the impact of the uh, this production system chicken and the eggs have the least impact as compared to other animal production so that also contribute to our sdg number 13 climate action so this is the overarching purpose that how we as the poultry vets can contribute for the nation's security of the food so without any further ado i will invite our president uh, dr j m kataria sir to address uh, this august gathering dr kataria sir over to you thank you thank you dr makhija giving a very nice briefing thank you and good morning to all of you uh, dr day dr gaukare dr makhija dr reddy dr jayant dr sudhir our guest speaker both they will be speaking and i am really very happy to see that uh, due to corona we were not able to Uh, do something with under this uh, banner of our association ahp but now we have started with the webinar and subsequently we will be having few webinar and then going for the our annual conference and symposium so that is how we are planning and as uh, you know all that poultry definitely it is an industry and we are definitely uh galloping with the development but in between we have many you know uh, incoming problems uh, that is frequent with the every year we are getting with the avian influenza of course some objects some initiatives have been taken by the government how to control but uh, it needs uh, because poultry is mainly in the hands of in industry so industry what i feel they have to come in 
you know, together to fight for the things to, I mean, discuss what are the constraints which are in between putting hindrance to our development and progress with the poultry. And for this, perhaps industry has to join hand together. Even I was discussing some time back with the other industry people about it. And that is the feeling which we have to join together further to meeting our constraints, which are the handicaps coming in between in the progress. Because every time there is a break, outbreak of A and prices are going down, and we simply go for culling. But, you know, as an alternative or approach, what we say, we should also suggest the alternative. What if you, you we ask some farmer to cull the birds, but then what is the alternative we are going to give to the farmers? That is that question I have been asking in the ministry also and also with the industry to join hands. And so perhaps we can fight for our things and come up with some, you know, sustainability and consistency in our production. Because even if you see the milk and egg, both if you see rate wise, what we are paying, there is not much, you know, increase in the prices. But even I know Kerry is facing problem with the feed. Because feed cost is going very high. Maize is very high. So what is, what is that alternative government is going to give to the poultry farmers? That is very important. Of course, that is a very good source for energy, whether it is egg or chicken, easily digestible, good source of protein, less of fat. And of course, with the even generation in comparison to other livestock, poultry is uh, quite easily manageable if you go systematically from the beginning itself. So it is a good, uh, I mean, resource for the income as well as source for the protein for our ever generating, increasing population of the country where the protein source is very important. Now, how to maintain the poultry and come up with the poultry health? Uh, today we are going to speak Two speakers we are having, Dr. Sudhir and Dr. Jain. Uh, they will be speaking on stress due to winter and uh, IBS, inclusion body hepatitis. Now, if you see the winter, in North particularly, if it is winter, it is extreme. As on today, we are seeing extreme winter in the complete North. We have not been able to see the sun since last three days. It is all fog, fog. It is around 11 or 12, 30 people will come out and by three, they will be back in home. Now, everything is affected. Not only that livestock or poultry, even the business is also affected with this. And we have to think about it, how to manage. And due to winter, when winter is high, there is a problem of so many things comes in the birds. So how best we can manage so that there is less problem with the respiratory diseases. And this is the time when we see in North, particularly Haryana, Punjab, lot of respiratory problems will come. LPI will also come. So that is how we are going to manage with the, of course, non-infectious factor that is very important. Infectious factor, even we can go for vaccination with good quality, of course, it is very necessary. I think Dr. Jain will be giving very good uh, outlook about it. And then about the IBH, that was a problem when it was first uh, described at the border of Pakistan in Punjab. Hello? And the, uh, one of our students you may be knowing, and uh, he came Man. here that, sir, there is a... Are you able to listen? Yes, yeah, sir. Dr. Kataria, sir, continue, please. Thank you. Yeah. So there, there was a problem with the IBH, and they used to call lychee disease. We were surprised, what is this lychee? Lychee is telling, but now 
it has become, you know, very a uh, permanent feature of inclusion of body hepatitis. And earlier it was when we worked, we were able to produce, I mean, inactivated cell culture vaccine with the type four. But as Dr. Gaukar said, there is a type four, type eight, and even he said type 11. Perhaps there are so many types. There are so many types, and one by one, you are seeing they are being uh, implicated in different manifestations. So perhaps uh, there is a need how we should redefine our approach for IBS because that is a disease which is self limiting, but it comes if it is not properly disinfected, sets and other things. So that that will come up and. Uh, it, it is giving a new, you know, new picture every time. And I think our speaker will be highlighting it. And with this, I wish all the best for the speakers to give, enlighten the public. And I think a good number has joined so far. Dr. Reddy may be having the count. But this, these are the very good topics which we have selected for today's webinar. And thank you very much. Thanks. And over to yeah. Dr. Matija. Thank you, Dr. Kataria, sir, for your such an inspiring note to set the context of this webinar. Really thankful to you for your inspirational words, sir. Moving next, uh, I will request our secretary, uh, Dr. M. R. Reddy, sir, to share his presentation. Thank you, sir. Sir, it is uh, shared, sir. Yes, Dr. Sir, we can see. And if you can put it in PowerPoint mode, it will be helpful. Yeah. I think now it is clear. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, all said, sir. Thank uh, you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay Makija. And uh, yeah, I'm just giving briefing about uh, AAHP. Just I will take only three, four minutes. Uh, so this uh, association of even health professionals, we got registered uh, during 2010. Uh, then our founder uh, president is Dr. Jim Kataria, who is having vast experience because since beginning from scientist to, uh, till his retirement, he is actually associated with poultry health. And uh, with his uh, help, we have actually registered this association. Um, then the objectives of this association is to provide a forum for the poultry veterinarians and other professionals, policy makers to exchange and disseminate ideas and technologies in even health and disease management and to promote interdisciplinary research in the field of even health for the benefit of poultry industry, then to work in association with and also in cooperation with other and, uh, and regional and national international societies organization having uh, complementary objectives, then to publish a journal, scientific journal that is uh, even health at regular intervals for the cutting edge scientific information concerning the diagnosis, treatment and prevention of poultry diseases as well as uh, food safety. So um, actually this association as an currently we have our president is Dr. J.M. Kataria and we have two vice presidents, Dr. D.K. Day and Dr. Gaukare and myself uh, secretary and we have treasurer Dr. T.R. Kanaki. And in addition, we have members Dr. H.K. Munialappa, uh, Dr. Vijay Makisa, Dr. Rajkumar and Dr. Chopra, uh, Chabra and Dr. Saravanan. And now at present, we have uh, 349 uh, life members and actually they spread across the uh, country around 22 states, all uh, 22 states, the figures I have given here. And uh, it's a very good, uh, I mean, um, distribution across the uh, country. Um, then uh, we have conducted actually a conference, a biannual conferences we are conducting. And so far, uh, we could able to conduct four conferences, that is 2012, 14, 16, and 18. The first one was in Hyderabad, second was in Pune, third one was in Goa, and fourth one was in Chandigarh. And because of COVID, we could not really organize in the uh, 2025th uh, conference. 
so as our president said we may be um, uh, organizing in the coming this current year uh, if everything goes well maybe in the october uh, first week or second week we are uh, planning then these are some of the uh, photographs from the previous uh, uh, conferences and uh, we actually include several foreign speakers also in our uh, technical sessions sponsored by uh, health companies uh, com companies and every year we used to keep three four uh, foreign speakers and also uh, we are honoring our uh, eminent scientists and even for poultry uh, consultants uh, those who are actually contributed significantly to the poultry industry so we introduced actually this lifetime achievement award during 2016 first uh, in the first time we given uh, for two people that is dr arun uh, arunesh gowda and our uh, president dr jm kataria and during 2018 conference in chandigarh uh, dr k s prajapati and dr s tongwong these two got this award in addition we are also giving young scientist awards at the uh, time of i mean during uh, conference uh, based on their research findings presentations so other activities what uh, we are taking and planning so as i said as per the objective one of the objectives we have to come up with journal so uh, we are actually in the process of uh, publishing this journal and one committee is formed and shortly uh, we are going to meet then uh, ahp website because earlier we have initiated but uh, due to some reasons we could not continue and now we are again going to uh, construct a new website for the webinar i mean AS, uh, our ahp then uh, um, second third one is the webinar series uh, recently in the ec meeting it has been decided to organize webinars maybe once in two months uh, before uh, organizing the physical conference that is in the october so here actually i request uh, maybe some all the audience and the participants they can suggest some of the topics which are actually current and important for the uh, industry uh, so that we can include in the coming uh, webinar series those uh, topics and the next ahp conference as i mentioned so this is actually as we said in the ec uh, executive committee meeting we may organize in the october that will be communicated soon and also there was a discussion on the certification of uh, our poultry veterinarians like uh, member of royal college of veterinary scientists member of hostel college of veterinary scientists and diplomat american college of poultry veterinarians so this actually uh, needs examination and also practical or uh, viva so two papers of examination and then followed if they pass then followed by a practical and interview type of thing so this is just in the initial stage uh, we have uh, discussed this point in the last uh, ec meeting and everybody has supported so we are actually uh, proceeding further and if any uh, if anybody uh, has got any some ideas they can uh, also just um, suggest us so that we can include in the uh, how to go about examination conducting examination of course for the, this ahp cannot uh, uh, conduct this one we need to have a separate uh, uh, body for this so that we have to register if everybody agrees then we'll go ahead go for that one also so this is briefly about this association and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, dr vijay makija for giving this uh, opportunity thank yeah. you uh, thank you dr reddy sir uh, indeed uh, is a fantastic overview of the ahp for the uh, all the audience who have joined this webinar so you took us to the entire journey of ahp and the path forward and i am very confident that the, the the webinar series is the kick start of those uh, revival of the activities which were hold due to covid situation so thank you dr reddy sir and to all the participant as dr reddy requested in case uh, you have any topics to suggest for this subsequent webinars uh, this is a great opportunity the chat box is open please do recommend us suggest us uh, any topic which you think for the poultry health and disease management related topic if you have any recommendation uh, we are more than happy to learn from you so now it's indeed my pleasure and privilege uh, to briefly introduce dr rupalikar sir because if i start talking about his cv it will take a quite a long time but in the interest of this webinar timing i'll be very brief 
to share that Dr. Rukhlikar sir is the renowned pathologist in our country with more than 37 years of work experiences. And he has been uh, studied throughout his academia in Bombay Veterinary College in the field of veterinary pathology. He also was an assistant professor over there. Uh, then he served a lot many years in the organization like Venki's group as the safety GM and more so ever in his next role he worked in the AVP and Globion vaccine division as well and not only that he is worked in this corporation but he also spread his area of working in consulting across the poultry segment not only in India but many of the South Asian countries many of the Middle East countries and many of the African countries so ladies and gentlemen uh, with this brief, I request Dr. Sudhir Rukhlikar sir to please enlighten us on the mitigating strategies for the winter stress. So Dr. Rukhlikar, it's all yours. And just for the announcement, uh, the chat box is open. During his presentation, if you have any question, please type it. And once both the speakers are completed with their presentation, we will take a Q&A uh, session with a dedicated attention to all your queries clarification, comments, or feedback. So first, Dr. Rukhlikar, sir, will uh, complete his presentation, then Dr. Deshpande, sir, and then we'll have a and a session as well. And Dr. Rukhlikar, sir, has been kind enough to confirm us that his slides would be circulated to the AHP members through a website or through email. So please um, focus on the learning interaction during this webinar. The slides, you will get it, all the participants who have joined this webinar. So, Dr. Rukhlikar, sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Good morning to everybody, all the attendants, resident of AHP, and all the guests. Uh, as Dr. Vijay has said, and Dr. Katari also, ex also said in the beginning, uh, the cold winter has set throughout the country, and our poultry fraternity is experiencing a lot of problems. So, what we are going to discuss is how to mitigate this winter stress in poultry production. So I welcome you again. As uh, we everybody knows that we enter any business to get some money. It's not a charitable trust. And poultry is also not an exception. But uh, as we know, mainly we are discussing about two segments, broiler birds and their birds. And of course, breeders is also a very important section. So when we think of broilers, which is a major uh, country, a major uh, business of poultry section, we are having basically two targets. One is uh, to get early marketable body weight with lowest possible mortality and lowest feed conversion ratio. And of course, maximum day gain and maximum European efficiency factor. Those are the main targets for broader birds. When we think of layer birds, our target is to get maximum number of saleable quality, optimum quality eggs with lowest feed intake and lowest mortality. And breeders, of course, the most number of saleable chicks with lowest feed per chick. So these are our basic targets, but how to achieve them, of course, is again an important topic. And where in the first and very most important point, which I always stress in all my uh, presentations is minimum stress on the birds. Because any type of stress, any kind of stress on the poultry birds will definitely hamper their in performance like anything, be it broiler or breeder or layer. So then, of course, the most important input would be best quality feed, which accounts for almost 75 to 80% of expenses. Best management, there is no uh, any exception for good or best management. Management is the key. So we are going to discuss one of the parts of management today. Stringent biosecurity, which we have learned right from 1992, ever since IBD entered India, 92, 93. They of course, prevention of diseases. These are all the targets. So when we are thinking of stress, as I said, stress would be the most important factor in performance of our poultry birds. And there are a large number of stress factors, maybe infectious, maybe non-infectious. In the infections, of course, we know viral, bacterial, and fungal, and parasitic. And then non-infectious could be feed-related or could be environmental stress. Now, as we are in the winter phase, or very cold season throughout the country. Of course, North is the highest or very severe cold as Dr. Kataria said in the morning. So we will be focusing more on winter management or how to prevent or manage the winter stress or cold stress. 
and we, everybody knows that broiler birds are more susceptible to cold than layer birds. Now, with, if we think of thermoregulation, of course, it's much, much different than our mammalians. As it is, we know that the body temperature of chickens is very high. It's almost 104 to 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So it already is more. And they can be well managed in a temperature range of 21, 20, 25 degrees Celsius, which is called as a thermoneutral zone, which is a comfort zone for birds to perform. When the temperature goes below 20 degrees Celsius, it will cause very severe cold stress to the birds. And naturally, there will be physiological changes in the birds. Now, temperature management in poultry house is an important precondition for better production and health of birds, be it a winter or be it a summer. We have to manage the temperature very nicely so that the birds are in comfort zone and we'll get the best production out of them. Now, what are the conditions in winter what we are facing? Of course, a very low environmental temperature. Now, as we were seeing in the news, three days back, Delhi was two degrees Celsius. So very cold, very chilled environments, that is one. Ventilation is poor because the density of air is more. Photo period is less because even though there is daytime, still as Dr. Kataria said in the morning beginning, last three days he has not seen in the sun in the north. So decreased photo period is also one of the challenges which we are facing in the winter season. Now, whenever there is a winter, there will be cold stress on the birds. Now, this cold stress will affect in various ways uh, so that it will affect the performance of the birds. The homeostasis dysfunction, which is caused by cold stress, remain a threat to intestinal health, particularly for young broiler chickens. And that's why we can see many problems related to digestive system in the broiler chickens. It is over, often overlooked since chickens generally handle cold temperature better than hot temperature. As I said in the earlier slide, their body temperature being very high, they can handle cold, cold temperature better than hot temperature. But still, cold stress is just as dangerous and as deadly as heat stress. That we must remember. It is not only heat stress. Now, the temperature at which a chicken starts experiencing cold stress is called critical low temperature. But just a reduction in the temperature doesn't cause cold stress. The birds may be cold, but they are not under cold stress. So at a temperature where the cold stress starts, it is known as a critical low temperature. And it varies for each chicken, not for each breed or each type of bird. In a flock of, say, broilers of 10,000 birds, every bird will have a different critical low temperature that we have to decide. Now, the cold itself wouldn't be that much of a problem for the adult birds. But the humidity that goes along with it might cause some troubles, especially in relation to respiratory problems. Because it only cold will not cause the problem. We know the humidity is also very high. The air movement is low. And that's why the respiratory problems will be more. And that's why we are having more problem of respiratory related problems in winter season. What are the adverse effects we are getting? One, of course, is a decrease in egg production. We know that even there is no any disease, you are giving good quality feed, management is good. Still, you will see some drop in production. Birds tend to take less water. There is reduction in consumption of drinking water. The poor FCR in broilers. Generally, what happens? The winter is supposed to be healthy season. And if you manage well, definitely you will get very best results in broilers in winter. But if you don't manage properly, or if there are lacunae in your management to combat the winter stress, there will be definitely more intake and less body weight. So poor FCR in broilers is a very common thing. Naturally, the weight gain will be less. Like in broilers, we are expecting like 70 grams day gain, which may be very low. In case of breeders, the fertility will go down. And naturally, there will be some increase in the mortality since the birds are not in healthy condition. These are some of some more factors. Ruffled feathers, because birds try to uh, conserve energy, and that is why you get ruffled feathers. The circulation is also slightly reduced to conserve the energy. That is one more effect. Shivering, so that birds can have some uh, heat generation. And one point is enzyme reduction, which is slightly neglected or not very commonly addressed issue. 
there is enzyme reduction. Enzymes are proteins and they are affected by extreme cold and utilized faster. So what enzymes would be utilized slowly in normal temperature of 21 to 25 degrees Celsius will be used very fast. And naturally, there will be effectiveness and efficiency reduction in the digestion. And you know, the entire performance is mainly uh, based on the gut health. So if the enzymes are reduced, naturally, you will get much, much lower digestibility, much lower effectiveness. And decrease in immunity, of course, it's there in many seasons. But whenever there is stress, there will be decrease in the immunity, immunosuppression of the birds. In case of layer type of birds, it is seen that they use four times more energy than recommendation to maintain their body temperature. So naturally, there will be uh, a feed diverted to energy for maintain, maintenance and not for production. So temperature drops, the feed intake increases, we know it. For every increase of one degree, sorry, every decrease of one degree Celsius in the temperature, there will be increase of feed intake by one to 1.5 grams per bird per day. Of course, layers, there is some restriction they cannot use at, at libidum, but still there will be increase in feed intake. And naturally, we know that the feed intake is related to egg size. So when the birds can eat, eat more feed, naturally we'll see the no, more number of large eggs produced by the birds. Of course, this can be managed through diet specifications. Everybody knows that we formula diet as for the season and the production stage of the birds. Now, what are the factors which will decide the severity of cold stress? Because just drop in temperature, say from 20 degrees to 12 degrees or 8 degrees, will not cause cold stress on all the birds. There are other factors which uh, give some uh, idea as to how much the bird will be cold stressed. First and foremost is age. The adult birds will be okay. They will not face that much stress, but very young and very old birds, they will be having more susceptibility towards cold stress. So if a temperature of 12 degrees is causing a problem in first week chicks or eighth week uh, layer birds, it will not cause, uh, sorry, first week or uh, 80 week birds, it will not cause any problem for middle aged birds. If you look at the weight, that is one more factor. The overweight birds are not that much vulnerable, whereas underweight chicken, underweight as compared to their standard weight chart, will be more susceptible, more, more vulnerable to cold stress. If we think of diet, diet is of course a very important factor in all our uh, performance criteria. But if the diet which we are giving in the winter season is not having enough energy and enough protein levels, which are needed for winter, then these birds are again more susceptible to cold stress. They will suffer more and their performance will be more hampered. Humidity, as I said, there is more humidity in general in winter. The air movement is low. The density of air is more and it will put more stress on the birds. And airflow, if there are direct drafts, drafts on the birds or direct wind blowing, naturally it will give, give a very freezing environment and the birds will be having more serious cold stress. Now you know what is cold stress, how it will affect, what are the factors which are affecting the birds depending on age or stage of production and all that. So now we must think how to mitigate the winter stress for better productivity. That is the main uh, topic which we are discussing. So there are certain factors which can help us in uh, getting the birds a little comfortable even in the cold season. Uh, one is to close the shade from two shade sides, either gunny bags or plastic sheets. These curtains can be installed on the side walls of the shade where the cold air is likely to enter into the shade. So those points need to be blocked. Of course, you should not block the ventilation of the shade because if we are fully packing the shade from both the sides, we are blocking the ventilation. So we will not cover the entire side wall will ensure sufficient open area towards ceiling of the shed to facilitate escape of stale air. Because we know the ventilation is very important. We are seeing in the next slide. So if we try to conserve the heat, many times we completely close the shed. This mainly happens in brooding time also. And then a lot of ammonia, if you are heating something, a lot of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, 
all those gases will accumulate. So we will not restrict the ventilation. However, we will try to put the side curtains which will block the entry of cold air. If you are looking at the uh, broiler shades, the curtains should be opening from top to bottom and not from bottom to top. Because bottom you will have very cold air, top you will not have. So when you open from the top, you will not see the very cold air entry. It will be only a normal air. So you will get fresh air inside so that the stale air goes out along with dangerous gases. So these are two photographs I've taken from the magazine called Poultry Punch, which are again in the northern part. You can see they have closed the shed from the uh, with the help of gunny cloths. Similar uh, measure can be taken with the help of a polythene sheet also. You can see these are polythene sheet. But as I said, you can see the upper part or towards ceiling, they have put a part open so that there is no blockage of ventilation. Some ventilation will continue and the birds will not suffer from any respiratory problem. So these type of things which are very easily uh, adaptable, not very expensive, we can use to protect the birds from direct winds. Now different age of birds, they will be differently uh, tolerable to the cold stress. As I said, the young birds will be very vulnerable. Older birds will not be very vulnerable. Very old will be again susceptible. And as we know, the devout chicks are most vulnerable to the cold stress. And that's why this tip is always there for entire season, not only for entire year, not only for winter, that the chick shed needs to be warm before the chicks enter the shed. So like if you see the new human baby, it is completely wrapped in wooden blanket and everything. You cannot wrap every chick. So the entire shed has to be warm at least 24 hours before arrival of chicks. So if you know expected time of chicks, you have to start the heater heating devices earlier, maybe gas burners, maybe electric heaters, maybe any other booker or anything that we should start so that you get a temperature of about 95 degrees Fahrenheit before arrival. Now this is just above the chicks, say three to four inches above the chicks. This is not the temperature of the entire shed. It may be just 83, 84 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, but at the level of chicks, you can measure with the uh, laser thermometers also. It should be around 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees centigrade. So that is very important because the day old chicks are most vulnerable to cold stress. When you're thinking of litter, now generally what happens is, I've seen in many farms, they put the litter of hardly two inches, not more than that. Two inches is also rarely seen. But when you are thinking of winter, it has to be six inches deep because there are two factors. It is insulator. It will not allow the cold from the floor to come through leg, through uh, for the legs to the body. It will try to keep the body warm. It will absorb excess moisture because we know whenever there is more moisture in the litter, it is a very good conducive environment for all the fungi and virus and bacteria to grow and coccidia. So it will be absorbing excess moisture. It will be insulator. Unless it is six inches, it will not serve these purposes. So we have to spend a little more on litter so that chicks get a good warm feeling. Now, what is the indication that chicks are feeling cold? They will be chirping loudly or they are a bit huddling in the groups, trying to sit at one place and get some warmth. So this indication is clear that the chicks are not happy. They are having feeling very cold stress. And then we can use heaters or bukharis. Earlier, the heating was done only in the only with the bulbs. Then so many newer devices came. Bukharis are there, electrical devices, heaters are there, gas burners are there. Anything we use, you have to heat the shed so that we get a good warmth in the shed. Now, when I said ventilation in earlier slides, we have to produce, sorry, give good ventilation without reducing the shed temperature. So that is always a very big task in winter season because we have to close the shed. Unless we close the shed, the temperature won't be maintained. When you completely close the shed, the temperatures will drop. So we must give a good ventilation without reducing the shed and I temperature. And as I said in earlier slide, we should keep some part towards ceiling open so that the fresh air comes inside without much chilling into the shed. Now, what are the advice, advantages of good ventilation? 
it will reduce the stress on the respiratory system thereby improving the performance as dr katare said in the beginning in the winter season mostly we will be experiencing respiratory problems and if we are giving poor ventilation it will be adding oil to the fire so ventilation has to be good to reduce the stress on the respiratory system in certain shades i have seen the provision of sliding windows when the uh, lights when the daylight goes off when or when the it is very chilly they will close the side windows when the weather is good they will open the side windows that also can sliding windows that also can be a good measure to keep the ventilation because poor ventilation will be having increased levels of ammonia in the shade and we know the ammonia will be the most detrimental gas for our respiratory tract everybody knows that we are having the primary defense is our respiratory tract to restrict the entry of all this main uh, respiratory problem causing pathogens and uh, there will be highly irritation the simple thing is if the ammonia is there nh3 plus there is mucus inside which is already there for protection so h2o water in the mucus plus nh3 will be cause forming nh4oh ammonium hydroxide which will be highly irritating so we must see that the ventilation is always given a proper way when we think of water management provide warm water to the first week chicks because as the temperatures are very low the water will be very chilled even we if we drink very cold water in winter we will not take second sip we stop with one sip so same thing will be chicks they will just dip their chick at big uh, and remove it if it is very cold so we have to give warm water now you we need not heat entire 200 liter 400 liters water we can have some boiling water maybe 5 10 liters and add to that 200 liter tank or 100 liter tank that will increase the temperature of water and chicks can have warm water when the warm water is there the water intake will be better generally what happens is as i said in the very second third slide the water intake itself is reduced even we people many times forget to drink water and we have to remind ourselves in winter that we must drink water because to remain Yes. hydrated is very important at any at any given point so you give the warm water the chicks will consume it and then even in the elder birds sometimes you may have to give some warm water fresh and clean drinking water 24 hours a day by all the days is very important in all the seasons more so in winter when we are giving any vaccine to drinking water or any medicine to drinking water we have to take more precautions because as it is the water intake is low in case of winter season the birds we have decided that so many liters of water for vaccinating to drinking water for so many birds that same calculation may not work well for winter season for example in broilers we say that for water vaccination we should take the liters of water equal to number of their age days so if we are giving drinking water for 1000 birds of 20 days we should use 20 liters for 1000 birds but in winter this may not hold good we have to reduce we may have to reduce the water by another 25% or so and again we have to keep them without water for some time we have to make them thirsty maybe for vaccination maybe for medication for them to completely consume that medicated vaccinated water we have to take precaution to starve them of water maybe for 2 hours 3 hours depending on season and then we have to give this in lower quantity of water so that they consume complete medicine or complete vaccine otherwise it will be only on paper and effectivity of vaccination will be very low so these precautions we must take and as far as uh, feed uh, management is concerned one is the feed has to be high energy feed we know that we need more energy in winter to maintain the warmth in the body even we people who may be eating say if we are thinking of roti we are eating four rotis in winter we will eat six rotis so similar thing will happen in case of birds also they will need more food more feed and for just to satisfy the requirement of energy but what will happen is when the they will eat more feed naturally other factors like other nutrients like protein and minerals and all things will also go in excess that should not happen that's why we have to formulate the feed accordingly so that it becomes high energy feed if it is high energy the quantity of feed intake will remain low normal feed and naturally other factors will also go 
normally or if we are giving the low energy feed normal feed we have to reduce the energy uh, sorry reduce the other factors like protein and minerals and vitamins so that they unnecessarily go in excess and waste the money of the farmer then number of feeders we should increase because the birds are reluctant to move to conserve the energy if you put a feeder at little nearer place than other seasons they will be tempted to eat otherwise they will sit at one place so increase the number of feeders so that birds will be consuming more and more feed now what are the dietary tips for winter one is increase the protein why as i said one of the factors is cold stress reduces enzymes and enzymes are proteins so we have to give more protein so that the enzymes continue to have their role and digestion will be better we said the immunity is down immunosuppressed birds so immunity boosters are available maybe chemicals maybe phytochemicals maybe herbal products whatever there are are available with good results proven track record those immunity boosters can be used either through water or feed so that the birds will be able to fight the challenges of infection then stimulate circulatory system i said the circulatory system is also slowed down restricted to conserve the energy some people use ginger either through feed or through water so that the circulatory system is stimulated and you will see a better performance of the birds fats we know the fats give a very good energy it is the best source of energy and linoleic acid which is a great source of energy but we must see that we have to uh, make a balance of carbohydrates and proteins also because they also generate heat earlier if you see the very old concepts in the summer times people used to increase the protein and reduce the uh, energy content so that the birds will not be fatty or uh, having good performance but now it is known that the per gram fat the heat generated in the body per gram of fat and per gram of protein if you compare the heat generated by 1 gram of protein is more than heat generated by 1 gram of fat so we have to see that we have to balance all these three factors and we have got one more advantage of more fats uh, in winter they will slow down the metabolic rate so that the absorption of the nutrients is better in case of this winter also and then use of electrolytes and probiotics now some people will ask me why electrolytes in winter we are always prescribing them in summer why in winter the electrolytes also are there since the body is not functioning all the systems are not functioning properly and the birds need to stay hydrated they should not be dehydrated and for that we have to just use some quantity of electrolytes but take precaution not to dis disturb their electrolyte balance into the body of the birds and keeping the gut flora healthy by probiotics because uh, gut health as i said is a very important factor in getting good performance from the poultry birds of all the types whether broiler or layer or breeder so use of electrolytes and probiotic is also a very important factor so these are some dietary tips for winter then just see some photographs of uh, what we can see in uh, winter one is uh, our um, 24 hour guest e coli or coli bacillosis even if we open one day old chicks sometimes we are seeing this coli bacillosis in bird big birds also we are seeing this which is again a very common thing then ccrd a complicated picture complicated crd we are seeing very commonly as we see a very thick cover on the liver very hepatitis pericarditis and this formation of exudates in the air sacs which is very common in ccrd again this ccrd uh, crd they are common in winter that's why i taken this photographs mycoplasma we know the air sac is we can see the cloudy air sac which normally should be very transparent clean so this cloudy air sacs cloudy air sac air sacculatis indicative of mg then frothy air sacs these are all again indication of mycoplasma galliceptica since these are common in winter i'm just showing you some photographs coccidiosis as i said earlier the if the litter is not properly dried or the quantity is little less the it doesn't become dry very easily and then there is good conducive environment for this coccidial oocyst to develop and we can get these also then open mouth breathing respiratory problems very common and nd and hpi lpi they are very common in the winter so i have taken some photographs from these two diseases 
open mouth breathing of course may not be only nd or hpa or lpa it may be other factors also but open mouth breathing respiratory sign very common nd we can see uh, twisting of neck in many birds uh, then highly pathogenic air of course what we as uh, dr kataria said we many times experience lpa hpa is not uh, very common but lpa we see and uh, hemorrhagic trachitis we are seeing of course you generally use some other words maybe vvnd maybe variant but we are facing these times also so these are different types of uh, diseases what we are experiencing or what we are likely to experience in winter and if we want to mitigate the cold stress to avoid these things all those factors of management dietary tips and other things uh, this feed uh, uh, reformulation all these play a very important role if you go with all these things definitely we can mitigate the cold stress and get a good production so thank you very much for your kind attention as dr vijay said the question answers will be taken in the later section thanks a lot thank you dr rukrika for providing just, such a we'll just close by this yeah sure sir yeah thank you dr rukrika such a nice overview of the challenges what we are facing and also the practical tips to mitigate those challenges definitely uh, we will have time for if if there are, though the presentation is so crystal clear but if there are some questions or additional comment Uh, we will definitely take it afterwards so moving uh, next into our webinar is the speaker dr jayant deshpande sir indeed you know uh, it's privilege and honor to welcome you dr deshpande sir and thank you for uh, accepting our invitation so dr jayant deshpande is a very known personality in the field of uh, veterinary microbiology particularly poultry so doctor has been with many decades in the poultry sector and uh, have served the organizations like godrej in the past and also india farm and the very renowned veterinary uh, microbiologists across the segments of poultry whether handling the ggps parents commercial operations pan india so you are the right person sir to please share us your practical insights on the ibh issues what we are facing and and dr kataria sir rightly mentioned in the beginning of this webinar that we would be taking the contemporary topics contemporary issues which are uh, kind of bothering our veterinary uh, doctors who are taking care of poultry so this topic is a burning topic right now ibh so none other than you sir can uh, share your experiences and of course we have august gathering to also share their observation feedback and and, and uh, you know get their doubts clarified so dr deshpande sir the uh, next 30 minutes is for you sir uh thank you uh, dr vijay and uh, hello thank you <clears throat> are you able to hear sir yeah we can yeah and you can start sharing the screen and continue yeah yeah uh, good morning and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present myself uh, about uh, the ibh i uh, the slide is okay slide share is okay Yeah. yeah we can see it doctor uh, you can continue please yeah, yeah. Uh, inclusion body hepatitis though it is a very old uh, uh, disease the old means it is uh, in the world it was discovered long time in, in 60s and in india in 80s uh, as dr uh, kataria sir mentioned it was in uh, pakistan our neighboring country where it started first but now it is seen across the country and many regions i think it is present all over the world yeah. Uh, inclusion body hepatitis so just to introduce it is a inclusion body hepatitis is a very economically important adenovirus infection um because uh, uh, ibh uh, is a that causes very heavy losses in poultry because it affects the adult birds in the sense uh, growers uh, in the range of 3 4 weeks that's why there is always a impact on the economics because it affects the fcr very badly and increases the mortality rate also and it is characterized by clear straw colored fluid in the pericardial sac discolored liver mainly it affects liver kidney and uh, heart and uh, typically it produces inclusion bodies which we will see later in the uh, slides 
So etiology, it belongs to uh, AV adenovirus, the group one. It's a DNA virus and it has uh, several serotypes and uh, as of now, 12 serotypes have been identified. Uh, it, and normally IBH occurs as a secondary infection to immunodeficiency caused by IBD or CAV-like diseases, which are very commonly present in the field. Uh, so this is about uh, brief about the etiology. Transmission, it can transmit both uh, vertically through uh, parents to the uh, uh, commercial chicks through eggs and uh, lateral uh, or horizontal transmission also is present. And horizontal spread is by latent carriers. That means once the bird is infected, it remains carrier forever. And these latent means the birds which are not showing uh, lesions or signs or symptoms, they transmit the disease to the fresh the birds, uh, especially in multiple age farms. And uh, the other reason for transmission is poor biosecurity, multi-age farms, especially live bird trading, uh, because we have seen uh, these live bird trading trucks which come to farms, they not only carry one uh, infection, they have carried many infections, which we have uh, seen practically. And uh, that is one, uh, one of the major transmission of uh, many viral and uh, bacterial diseases in our system, because there is no control over the uh, live bird trading uh, in, in India. Then uh, other thing is the fecal contamination, uh, that is mechanical uh, contamination through uh, clothes, footwear, equipment and people movement, vehicles. Um, then sometimes contaminated vaccines, uh, which is very common, uh, or maybe sometimes uh, in the past, we have come across uh, many contamination of the vaccines. And this virus grows in uh, nasal and tracheal mucosa, conjunctiva and kidney. That means it has uh, affinity to many organs. It is not uh, uh, limited to one organ. So that is why uh, all the excretions and secretions, including feces and uh, 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 tears that is uh, coming from eyes and uh, uh, mucus coming from the uh, trachea and nasal passage, they carry a lot of vi virus, which is a major contamination, contaminant, contaminating uh, 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 fluids. And uh, as I already said, uh, it affects uh, FCR very badly in minus because it the mortality happens at the uh, later stage. Uh, some of the classification of the uh, uh, inclusion body hepatitis. This is uh, called uh, foul adenovirus A, C, D, and E groups. So the serotype one causes uh, gizzard erosions, which is uh, again very common problem in young chicks. And uh, serotype four and ten it causes uh, hydropericardium syndrome, which is uh, uh, very commonly seen. And uh, other uh, strains like 2, 3, 9, 11, then group E, 6, 7, 8A, 8B, they cause inclusion body hepatitis. So there is a small difference between uh, uh, pericard uh, hydropericardium syndrome and inclusion body, where in inclusion body, we clearly don't see any uh, hydropericardium, though there is a very small accumulation of uh, fluid in the pericardium, whereas inclusion body mainly affects the uh, uh, liver. So these are the different uh, classification of the uh, strains which are identified. Then uh, pathogenesis, uh, first the virus enters through the uh, various routes like uh, orofecal route, that means uh, fecal contamination or respiratory system. And uh, it multiplies in uh, intestines. And then the after infection, there is a, a viremia. And uh, after viremia, it uh, spreads uh, the virus spreads to other organs like liver, kidney, bone marrow, bursa, including respiratory system. And uh, at this stage, virus can be isolated from uh, feces, bursa, nasal and ocular discharges. And uh, as the virus grows into these organs, these organs will show different lesions. So that is a, that will help us to identify the disease. And once the uh, birds are infected, they remain carriers forever. So, and they keep causing, uh, uh, spreading the infection to other uh, healthy birds. And uh, the uh, serotypes which can cause different lesions, uh, like already I mentioned, this is again a reputation. Uh, group A, uh, serotype 1 causes gizzard erosions, which is uh, again burning problem along with uh, 
hydropericardium and uh, IVH. Then group C4 and 10 uh, serotypes, uh, like typically they, it, they cause hydropericardium and uh, swollen liver and kidneys. And uh, group D, like serotypes 2, 3, 9, and 11, they, call, they cause uh, inclusion body hepatitis. And here typically we see uh, enlarged liver, pale liver with hemorrhages on the uh, liver. And uh, group E serotype 6, 7, 8, A and B, again, they say, more or less the, the lesions are similar. Again, it causes uh, uh, inclusion body hepatitis. And mainly liver and kidneys are uh, involved. Uh, these are the uh, different types of uh, lesions uh, what we see. Then uh, clinical science, uh, uh, this is very common uh, problem these days all across uh, uh, country. Uh, typically, the mortality starts after three weeks, specifically around 24, 25 days of age and continues for a week or 10 days, depending on the uh, birds which, have, which show uh, immunosuppression. If there is severe immunosuppression because of a concurrent infection like uh, IBD or uh, uh, CAV, then the mortality may continue for longer period. And uh, at a later stage, uh, the mortality subsides on its own. Like uh, uh, Kataria sir mentioned, it is a self-limiting disease, but it causes a lot of uh, damage. And um, the other clinical signs like uh, jaundice, that is yellowish uh, discoloration of the carcass or few birds show yellowish discoloration. And um, chalky gray to bright yellow mucoid droppings. So droppings are uh, frothy and... Uh, uh, yellow colored uh, droppings we can see and uh, few birds show signs of difficulty breathing because the respiratory system is uh, affected. Uh, the birds become dull, ruffled feathers, then uh, birds become weak, then they lethargic and mortality happens. So mortality can range uh, between 2 and 40 percent uh, in IBH uh, depending on the concurrent infection it has. And uh, other, again, management also plays a very important role. Wherever management is very poor, the mortality rates are very high. And uh, uh, one typical thing about IVH is the mortality starts suddenly. It is not, not like any other disease where birds show some kind of a, uh, uh, depression and then slow mortality starts. And they, here it, it suddenly, if the bird is healthy, normal, and suddenly the mortality happens. And in case of uh, hydropericardium, the mortality rate is much higher, it can go up to 80%. So this is a small difference in that. Then uh, coming to uh, postmortem lesions, they are very typical lesions like uh, swollen liver. Uh, this is a one typical uh, lesion, what is called as mottled appearance on the uh, liver. So, or we can say, uh, uh, liver is uh, very, very typical. It becomes very shiny and uh, it looks like uh, tiles. So that's why it is called mortal liver, which can be differentiated from uh, other uh, problems, uh, uh, other issues where liver is involved. And uh, the liver, entire liver is involved. So, uh, there is a swelling of the uh, liver. Then kidneys are uh, severely swollen kidneys and uh, pale with hemorrhages. Uh, bone marrow is that's why we see a lot of uh, jaundice-like uh, lesion, uh, uh, clinical signs. Then bursa and spleen become very small, atrophy of uh, bursa and spleen. Uh, lungs are enlarged because of difficult breathing, congested and edematous, sometimes frothy air passages. Then uh, pericardial uh, fat becomes yellowish. Uh, so that's why we see yellow color uh, discoloration. And uh, other typical thing is blood becomes very thin. We can see actually blood which is uh, um, uh, present inside the abdomen or any other places when we open the birds. We see very watery kind of a uh, blood. Uh, some of the uh, photographs, see uh, this liver particularly looks uh, mottled appearance and uh, kidneys are uh, severely swollen. And uh, like I already mentioned for the uh, uh, litter, that is uh, feces. And this is a typical liver where we will see only in case of uh, IBH. Uh, so very easy to differentiate between the other uh, disease, other uh, liver problems. Then uh, this is uh, hydropericardium, typical hydropericardium. I think most of us, we have seen this uh, uh, right from uh, days there was an outbreak. 
so easy to identify like uh, it looks like a lychee fruit and this is the gizzard erosion gizzard erosion is also a very uh, typical and common problem these days and uh, uh, what happens is wherever there are gizzard erosions uh, the feed consumption becomes very slow uh, it also affects the feed passage and uh, digestion and that's why we will see a uh, lot of um, uh, undigested feed coming out of that and birds remain small uh, because uh, this problem uh, normally uh, gizzard erosion is seen right from day uh, week 1 so in the first week itself we can see lot of uh, gizzard erosion cases and uh, the entire flock gets affected because birds cannot consume uh, enough feed and uh, digest the feed and uh, one more picture these are the typical uh, swollen kidneys and uh, liver so liver becomes very shiny and the mortal so it is easy to identify uh, based on the uh, uh, post mortem and clinical signs then other typical lesion uh, in histopathology we see is uh, intra nuclear inclusion bodies so this is one of the uh, um, diagnostic tools where we can see the uh, these are basophilic uh, inclusion bodies so only problem is we, if there are any uh, facilities to check immediately we can uh, Uh, identify as a definitive diagnosis uh, uh, intra nuclear inclusion bodies in uh, uh, hepatocytes that is uh, liver cells so this is a typical uh, uh, nuclear in intra nuclear bodies are a typical identification uh, of the ibh so this is in brief about uh, uh, clinical signs and uh, lesions then uh, diagnosis uh, based on uh, clinical signs like uh, bird big bird sudden mortality then uh, we can make out bird becomes uh, uh, what we say jaundice type yellowish and uh, we can make out then pm lesions associated with clinical signs uh, the pm lesions which we have seen typical changes in liver then uh, histopathology intra nuclear inclusion bodies then immunofluorescence where we can identify the uh, virus with a uh, immunofluorescence uh, uh, stain then uh, virus isolation uh, elisa agarjal diffusion and pcr and again uh, we can uh, identify these strains uh, based on uh, genotype uh, analysis we can uh, see that uh, identify the different types of uh, serotypes which we can see so pcr is one which is very handy to identify the uh, uh, strains and uh, the diagnosis definition uh, different uh, definitive diagnosis can be made <clears throat> and some of the uh, rule to rule out few of the diseases which are uh, more or less similar to uh, ibh one is uh, fatty liver kidney syndrome uh, where same liver and kidney both are involved in the uh, infection so uh, like i said there is a minor changes in uh, uh, liver and kidneys where by which we can uh, differentiate on uh, on post mortem basis then ascites where uh, there is accumulation of fluid which can get uh, which we can which again uh, is uh, confusing with uh, hydropericardium because in ascites also we will see that there is little bit accumulation of uh, uh, pericardial fluid uh, of course ibd ibd there only difference is there is uh, again in in ibd kidneys are involved swollen kidneys which is the swelling is much higher and the bursa is uh, swollen whereas in uh, inclusion body hepatitis the bursa is atrophic and um, salmonella in salmonella again uh, liver is enlarged with uh, necrotic foci whereas in uh, I- ibh it is slightly different uh, then mycotoxins where uh, uh, liver is uh, uh, affected uh, mycotoxins uh, which again uh, increase the liver size and discoloration yellowish discoloration so we need to rule out uh, so there are different uh, diagnostic tools available to confirm the uh, in definite uh, diagnosis can be done based on that so this is in brief about uh, uh, diagnosis uh, coming to treatment side uh, there is no known treatment for any viral diseases we can only use uh, supportive treatments like uh, liver tonic vitamin e then diuretics where we can remove lot, uh, any accumulation of the fluids and kidneys can be flushed out uh, in case there is any secondary infection we can use antibiotics 
but better not to use because already kidney and liver are uh, damaged. So antibiotics will further add to the uh, toxicity of the liver and the kidneys. Then uh, to just give ele uh, energy, electrolytes and glucose can be given. And sometimes redu reducing protein, that means we can give a little um, uh, low protein, low fat diet, which will help birds to uh, digest and get some kind of nutrients and energy, thereby they can uh, thrive. Um, as the disease is self-limiting, these supportive treatment only will help to reduce the mortality rate. It may not really stop the infection or we will not be able to prevent, but it can only reduce the reduce mortality by a few percentage. So this is about treatment. And uh, coming to prevention, uh, vaccination is the only solution for the uh, prevention of the diseases. Uh, there are different strains and uh, in the field it is more confusing uh, which vaccine to be used. Because uh, uh, as of now, uh, the, the vaccines are used blindly. If we are able to identify the strain which is present in that area, uh, it can be done. But in our system, it is very difficult because our hatching eggs move from one area to another area. So it is difficult to, uh, whatever vaccines are done in one area and the strain is different in that particular area, uh, there might be some confusion. So it is better to get some data on prevalence of the strain. And uh, if that particular strain vaccine is used, it, we get a better uh, uh, better protection against uh, IVH. Uh, so strain-wise, I have just grouped uh, vaccinations available and uh, which can be used. Uh, so type 4, uh, zero type 4, it used in broilers at uh, day 1 to 10 and in uh, breeders at day 1, day 7, half dose and uh, week 21. And uh, group D, type 2 and type 2, 11 zero types. Uh, we, uh, in broilers, we can use between 1 and 10 days. And uh, in breeders, week 11 and 18. And group E, I think we, uh, eight, uh, eight B is most uh, prevalent in broilers as of now, present uh, situation. So vaccination can be done on day one in broilers. And uh, breeders, it can be done on 11 and 18 weeks uh, on seven day and uh, mid lay also it can be used. So this is only a suggested vaccination schedule. And uh, once the particular strain is identified in that area, because it is now the disease has become more endemic. So it is better to identify a strain. And again, strains might change uh, over a period of time. So at least once in quarter, once in six months, if the data is collected. And based on that, if the vaccination is done, uh, the, uh, the success rate of prevention is uh, much higher. So this is what is a suggested uh, vaccination study. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the uh, culling, bird, uh, culling of the birds and uh, the live bird trading, which is a major risk with, where the disease can uh, transmit. So strict biosecurity measures will help reduce not only one the IBH, but many other diseases. Whereas uh, IBH is a more economically important diseases, disease. So prevention is always a better area. And some companies are trying auto vaccines where uh, uh, I don't say success rate is 100%, but uh, there are uh, in case of emergencies and uh, in, in uh, absence of these vaccines in earlier days, auto vaccine was the only solution. So people are more well versed uh, how to make the auto vaccines. But one precaution on the auto vaccine is when the vaccine is made or when the vaccine is being produced, it has to be done when the viral activity in the organ which is used for producing the vaccine should be high. Then only the vaccine works. Otherwise, any vaccine, uh, any organs collected uh, if the uh, after the passing of the infection, uh, it may not be very effective. And um, as we know, auto vaccines also have some side effects because we don't know a lot of contaminants and impurities may be present in the uh, organs which we collect for the vaccinations. So this is about uh, uh, brief in brief about uh, inclusion body hepatitis. It is a major um, disease right now present in uh, uh, Indian poultry sector and uh, especially broilers and breeders are uh, very uh, severely affected in certain area. So prevention and uh, I think more and more uh, data needs to be produced and uh, 
a very effective uh, indigenous vaccine should uh, be produced to control the uh, disease in uh, uh, because it causes a lot of economic damage. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay, especially calling me and giving me the opportunity to present myself. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deshpande, sir. As always, sir, uh, your applied uh, experiences are very helpful for the entire uh, practicing veterinarians. And uh, this also, the presentation also sh sh shared some newer perspective for all of us. And now it's time, uh, I request uh, Dr. Rokulikar, sir, and Dr. Deshpande, sir, to please be available and keep uh, your microphone unmuted so that we can um, kickstart the Q&A. So, Dr. Rukulika, sir, am I, uh, can you take the first question which has yeah. come in the chat box? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Anand has asked the feedback from you about pathogenic lesions in cold shock for differential diagnosis beside the history of a low temperature situation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Actually, there is no any pathognomonic lesion as such, which you can say it's 100% diagnostic of cold shock. Only thing you have to judge overall environmental temperature and other factors which I mentioned, which will cause the cold stress, not only low temperature. So if you can correlate that thing, environmental temperature and other things, then you can see they are in the cold shock. And of course, the mortality will be seen uh, in some groups or some cor cor corners because the birds will be huddling together to get some heat. So that is only indication. There is no pathognomonic lesion as such in uh, winter cold stress. Yeah. Uh, so I'll keep on shuffling between Dr. Rukulika, sir, and Dr. Deshpande, because as the questions are coming up. So Dr. Uh, Deshpande, sir, this question is for you. Uh, will use of products containing triple salt of potassium monopersulfate help in arresting mortality of IBH? Uh, do you have any experience? Uh, see, any sanitizer or disinfectant uh, used for uh, spraying on the bird. See, there is no antiviral which, uh, as of now used in uh, uh, poultry. So these uh, sanitizers and disinfectants we mainly use to reduce the spread of the infection. It may not really help to cure the uh, infected bird. Whereas, say, for example, I mentioned... Uh, uh, the disease uh, spreads through fecal contamination or uh, respiratory system. By just spraying these uh, triple salt or anything antivirals, it will actually reduce the uh, spread to some extent. But already infected birds, it may not help really help. So that is what I mean. Thank you, sir. And I move to Dr. Rupalika, sir, uh, for a question uh, which is a little bit lengthy, so, but I'll read out. Uh, how to manage the energy and feed intake of birds in winters? Um, if we manage the winter stress by ventilation, the feed intake increases. So egg sizes increases and again causing problem to... Uh, so how to overcome this? It's really good and practical question. Many people <laughs> ask this question. As I said, if we are speaking of layers, uh, the one thing is, of course, the energy. But layer birds are not voracious eaters like broilers. They have some restricted capacity. Of course, not like they were not eating above 115 one, one grams earlier. They can go up to 130 grams also nowadays. But again, their feed intake is uh, restricted as compared to broilers. So best is to increase the energy content of the feed. Now, normally, many breeds are recommending around 2650 kilocalories energy per kg in laying feed. So maybe we have to increase another 100 kilocalories, 2750, so that their feed intake will remain in their normal range. And again, of course, uh, increase of egg size is generally related to linoleic acid and uh, uh, methionine. So those things we need to see how much digestive amino acid levels are there. Plus increase in energy should uh, try to keep the egg size in control and there won't be any issue of bigger eggs. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next, Dr. Deshpande, sir, do you feel uh, is there any role of CAV or subclinical IBD in development of IBH? Yeah, as I said, uh, concurrent infections uh, which cause immunosuppression will actually increase the incidence of IBH. So uh, CAV, which is more or less, it is a subclinical. And uh, COXI may, be, may not be really uh, uh, to that extent, but IBD and uh, CAV definitely will 
make birds more susceptible to IVH. Yeah. And uh, sir, this question is from Mr. Mohammad. He's asking, uh, is uh, the IBH vaccine being used in uh, commercial layers in India? Do you have any experience? Uh, as of now, no, because we really, uh, there are not, incidence is very low in case of layers. Uh, maybe some pockets they might be using, but not everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think uh, next one is, yeah. So we have, um, you know, we, meanwhile, we are also getting uh, feedback for the next uh, webinar topic. So please continue to share your recommendation. We really appreciate your uh, suggestion and inputs. We'll, uh, executive committee will definitely uh, populate all these topics and then um, uh, do the feasibility assessment uh, for the next one. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Munir Pasar uh, is uh, want to know from you, Dr. Ruplikan, uh, what is the quantity of ginger to be used to improve uh, in circulation, uh, if you can? Actually, there is no standard uh, established as such. All these type of treatments, like garlic, the lesson, or uh, this ginger, or many times people oh. find also carom seeds. There is no standard thing, but generally, one gram per kg of weight uh, should be okay to control the, uh, uh, to rather stimulate the circulatory system. You may use uh, taking out a juice, you can use or grinding it and then add into the feed. That also can be done. Around one gram per kg of weight is uh, generally safe. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Deshwande, sir, this from your, uh, this is perhaps not a question, but maybe wanted to know your input on this. The emergence of IVH in, uh, in India is a, could be related to the improper vaccination of birds in field condition. Uh, probably so your, your observation. Yeah, yeah, probably what happens is if we don't identify the strain and with which use, uh, it may not be really protecting, but the disease might be spreading. So uh, because, uh, right now, uh, there are uh, methods available to identify the strain and it is better to use the prevalent strain as a vaccine which will help in uh, keeping the disease in under control. Thank you. Uh, next is to Dr. Uh, Rukulika, sir, from uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir. Dear sir, as you mentioned, increasing energy and protein emulates the cold stress in broiler. One second, I will drop down. There are so many questions. So, uh, see what percentage word. of feed constituent to be used in what percentage uh, of the standard feed? So, maybe Dr. Rukulika, you can also check the question on the chat box. Yeah, I'll go through it. <laughs> okay, good, sir. Good, thanks. Yeah. Well, there are so many coming up, so yeah. Generally, uh, what happens is in case of uh, winter stress, whether it is a broiler or broiler breeder, the oil is given the prime importance, and soybean oil is of uh, topmost preference as far as many breeders are concerned. So that has to be increased. And uh, of course, in broiler breeders, there is no question of increased feed intake because we are trying to give measured quantity. There is not ad libitum feeding in case of breeders. So only thing to increase the energy so that that remain given feed allowance proves all the purposes uh, of production. We have to increase the energy and oil, basically soybean oil, crude soybean oil, what we are using, that should be the best source to increase the energy content. Uh, as far as other amino acids are concerned, I think in breeders, you need not uh, reduce them because we are not increasing the feed intake in any case. If you are giving 156 grams, you remain at 156 grams at particular age. You don't go to 170 grams. So only increasing energy and best would be uh, crude soil. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Deshpande, this is for you. Uh, what is the best way to handle IBH challenges in commercial broilers, like uh, either in directly broilers, uh, change of you know uh, vaccination schedules, or it has to be addressed at the breeder level. So in your experience, because you, you have been working across the value chain from GPs until the last mile of broilers. So what is your experience where to address this issue? See, it has to be addressed at both level, breeder level as well as uh, commercial level, because breeders are also get infected. And uh, because there is a vertical transmission, so it is always uh, uh, better to protect the uh, uh, breeders first. And then uh, maternal antibodies will be present, but uh, they will not protect till the end because the disease starts at later stage after three weeks. So really maternal antibodies may not uh, 
continue till such time. So breeder as well as broiler vaccination, both are recommended. So we need to protect breeders as well as uh, broilers. Both we have to protect by vaccinating. Yeah, I think um, the similar kind thing, uh, or maybe kind of a repetition of this question, uh, Dr. Sunil has asked, uh, in IBH, what do you suggest breeder vaccination rather than commercial broiler vaccination? And thus controlling with maternal antibodies or both breeder as well as the broiler. So I think, it's about uh, yeah. yeah, similar your topic you answered, right? So Dr. Sunil, I think uh, your question, uh, I think a couple of people asked the same question. So that, that clearly shows that this is a uh, you know, doubt everybody wanted to have your view, sir. So now, um, uh, if any member have, okay, yeah, one uh, question is from Dell. Uh, I could not see the name of the person, but the person is having a Dell mobile. So increased oil inclusion should be supported by appropriate emulsifier addition or otherwise. I think that is, of course, must whenever you use oil. Antioxidants and emulsifiers are must because overall, when you increase this oil content, the, there is always chance of rancidity development. So antioxidants and emulsifiers are must, no doubt. No, beyond that, I would like to have interference. Uh, not this is not answer to any question. Uh, when Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Sunil Kulkarni asked whether he uh, goes for breeder vaccination or broiler, nowadays the immunosuppression has become the major challenge. Whether you vaccinate your breeders or otherwise also. The broilers are always susceptible because of so many factors causing immunosuppression. So we must take care of all those factors which cause immunosuppression, maybe infectious, non-infectious, fear originated or environmental, whatever are the factors. That needs to be controlled so that, like Chavan Prash, they say, if you give Chavan Prash, your child won't fall sick anytime. So something like that we have to do with management, with feed, with uh, vaccination, so that immunosuppression is minimized. And that's why that question whether CAV or uh, subclinical IBD, can cause because in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, I've controlled this IBH with uh, change in the IB D vaccination schedule. But that's why I have that question. Thank you. Th thank, thanks, doctor. That, that's how you know the uh, wide variety of experiences of yours helps our participant. So, uh, one question which, which is around immunosuppression only, maybe Dr. Deshpande, Dr. Rukhalikar both can contribute, is like how to tangibly, you know, measure the impact of immunosuppression? Because it, it's such a wide term and uh, what is the degree of, you know, immunosuppression and, 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 you know, link it back to what causal agent? So, because you are the practicing vet, so you know uh, how you, you personally assess the impact of immunosuppression and how much you quantify uh, out of that, sir. Uh, there are two things. One is on the bird clinical side. Uh, there are a few uh, organs which are, which are impacted, mainly uh, thymus, bursa, and spleen. So normally, immunosuppressed and uh, immunocompromised birds, uh, uh, first thing is uh, thymus is uh, severely affected. So it easily we can make out on the uh, clinical side. Uh, of course, bursa, it depends because we do vaccinations and other things. Uh, on the quantification, uh, there are... Uh, of course, then we have to go to immunology, then uh, assess the uh, immunoglobulins and other things. But the best way is to check the titers. So maybe a healthy bird and how your titers behave. If there is a drop, sudden drops happening, or if the uh, required titers are not getting into the system. So that uh, uh, directly tells about the immunosuppression in birds. I'm talking about in terms of uh, clinical side, not from the laboratory side. If you really want to measure, there are different ways because immunity is not only humoral, there is also cell-mediated immunity. So there are different ways to check about the immune status. But as a clinician, we need to identify is on these two terms what I feel in brief and time. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, we probably covered all the questions which were came to the chat box and a couple of them you know, came to me directly as well. So uh, my request to Dr. Rupalika, if you need to, you know, advise or, you know, suggest our participant uh, three, let's say top three recommendation from your side, a kind of a take home message for our participant for mitigating strategies for winter stress. What would be that Dr. Rupalika, sir? A three top most uh, recommendation from you, sir. Okay. The first one, of course, modification of fit so that the feed intake will be in within normal expected range 
without affecting the performance. So that modification depends on the formulations and uh, uh, availability we have to do. Second factors, management, as far as shed warmth is concerned, try to keep the shed warm as far as possible because that is the one factor which will keep the birds active and in good production. And third is, of course, about any type of stress on the birds. We are speaking of winter stress. Any type of stress which causes even a suppression has to be uh, avoided. So that, of course, even the suppression itself is a topic where anybody can speak for hours together. But important points, like Dr. Deshpande said, there are factors which cause so many uh, factors which cause even the suppression, maybe feed bone or that has to be done. So even the suppression, prevention of even the suppression, keeping the shade warm without affecting ventilation, that is again underlying word. And then uh, modification of feed formulation to match their requirements and feed intake. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing the pulse of wisdom. Uh, Dr. Deshpande said a similar approach. I will request you, uh, uh, among all the you know, entire your presentation and your rich experiences, uh, at this junction, the current cur times, what would be your recommendation for uh, you know, control of IBH in commercial broilers and in, uh, also in breeders? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, uh, like I said, biosecurity, it plays a very important role and it is al almost uh, uh, forgotten uh, topic in our industry. So somehow we should start on working on biosecurity where we can minimize uh, uh, damages caused by infections. And second thing is uh, vaccination against immunosuppressive diseases like CAV, controlling them, or IBD, or Marex, because these days uh, we again see a lot of Marex cases coming up. So uh, these things we need to protect so that uh, the commercial chicks are not very, uh, they don't become more susceptible to these diseases. And of course, third thing is uh, we need to identify the specific strain in that particular area against IVH and uh, use that particular vaccine so that we can prevent the outbreaks. These are the three main things sir, I would suggest. Wonderful, sir. I think this should be, you know, a delight for everybody to focus on this area. Thank you, sir. And uh, now I request uh, our Honorable President, Dr. Kataria, sir, and of course, Dr. Eddy, sir, uh, to share uh, their, you know, concluding remarks uh, for this, the presentations and up till now the deliberation happened. So first I request Dr. Kataria, sir, and then Dr. Eddy, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Makija. And my sincere thanks to both the speakers uh, for giving such an illuminating task to cover both the aspects. Of course, winter management and IBH, which is emerging recently in the field, these are very important. We all know it, but, you know, when we present it, it gives a, you know, uh, how to approach it, a disciplined way. They tell each and everything, like stress, that is very important. How we manage stress. Anything which gives any disturbance is leading to stress. Even the sound gives stress. You know, if, where the carry is there and very nearby is the defense airport. And when initially the plane used to fly with the very big sound, birds used to die. But slowly now they have been adopted. So that is also a stress. So anything which can disturb the normal happening or the well-being of the birds lead to stress. And it is very easy to, I mean, now what is happening in North, put to, to put the curtain, but it is very important what doctor explained, the speaker explained that the top should be left because sometimes what happens, we cover, we cover the whole thing to avoid, we keep the conserve the heat, but that causes the more damage than the good. So th that, that is very important. These are the things, minor things, small things, but everybody should, I mean, remember and follow it for their, uh, this thing, even the warm water. Even nowadays you are seeing that our uh, Yogi uh, Ramdev Ji says, take hot water, warm water, even in winter. They say, even if you night, you feel sometimes rest to take hot water. So that is very important. Because inside is warm and suddenly cold thing goes, it causes the shocks to the birds, to the chicks. 
So these are very important, giving probiotics, immunity. These are every time we can give. And of course, like in winter, we take Chevan Pras. So for bird, it is very important to give the immune booster. And similarly for IBH, I will say uh, that when it started, it was hydroperic ardium syndrome. And in those cases also, you will find hydroperic ardium with along with the inclusion body hepatitis. And initially you will find basophilic inclusion, but subsequently it becomes eosinophilic in the after five, seven days. So this is how the disease progresses. And the immunosuppression is very important. IVH adenovirus itself is uh, quite immunosuppressive. May not be causing the permanent like IBD or chicken anemia, but they are immunosuppressive. They cause the transitory phase of immunosuppression. It has been seen. And Dr. Des Pandey very nicely explained about the latest classification about ACDE. Really, this is the new one and four and 10, both they come under that C. So this is very important. If you go for vaccination, they cover each other. They cover to some extent to each other and uh, you will find always a spiking mortality. There will be suit up within four or five days, six days, they start reducing by 10 days, it will be no. But by the time, death mortality will be very high, around 70 to 80% mortality will be there. And vaccination is definitely, whatever you do, the vaccination is very important to monitor. So, you know, zero monitoring, agent prevalence is very important. If you keep on monitoring, that is, I mean, the base where you can go for prevention of the disease. What you asked one of the participants has asked how to prevent for IBS. Perhaps zero monitoring and monitoring of the agents, like even Newcastle also, it has become very important. IBD. And of course, IBS, there are so many serotypes. So continuous monitoring of the emergence of the strains and accordingly deciding for the vaccination is very important. And of course, management and health are very good to avoid any stress with biosecurity and monitoring. With these words, I would like to once again thank both the speakers for giving very nice and the participants for their interest and in asking so many clarification, which have been very nicely defined by both the speakers. So thank you very much, both the speakers and Dr. Makija. Thank, thank you, sir, uh, for always, you know, being a guiding light to all of us, sir, in the entire executive team. Uh, I request Dr. Reddy, sir, to also share uh, his remarks on the deliberations so far. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay Makija. Uh, first of all, uh, I will thank our both the speakers for their excellent uh, presentation. And this is, I think, a very good beginning, uh, good start um, with this webinar. So I think maybe in the coming uh, times, we may uh, get more speakers and more topics we can cover. Uh, yeah, the speakers, uh, Dr. Rukadika said uh, maintaining ventilation, I think, is very important. When I was in Bareilly, uh, there was a uh, there is a uh, easy house of uh, 25,000 capacity each. They have got uh, two uh, floors and uh, they were struggling to maintain uh, ventilation. So especially in the winter, if they run the uh, cooling pads and fans, the temperature uh, goes down in the shed. If they stop, there is accumulation of uh, gases. So that's really ventilation management uh, really uh, very important uh, as with other uh, measures he has suggested. And regarding biosecurity, especially for IBH, uh, because it is, uh, as I said, uh, it's very important. One is uh, because it is a naked virus, IBH, CAV, and IBD. All are uh, naked viruses because earlier it was actually secondary. IBH is uh, we consider as secondary, but now it is coming as a primary disease also. So um, maintaining biosecurity, maybe we need more focus on biosecurity. Uh, of course, with this integration of forms, there is a very much improvement of uh, biosecurity, but still what type of uh, disinfectants we use and what quantity, whether really they are using proper concentration, proper quantity. I think that is also uh, very uh, important. Um, then uh, the last point is uh, because this IBH has got only killed vaccines, we don't have any live vaccines. So uh, coverage of uh, vaccination is also very important, what I feel. 
um, because uh, if, so if you see sometimes there are uh, titers, uh, very low titers and very high titers, the variation is very high. Sometimes even though uh, vaccines are good, uh, sometimes farmers, uh, when they do uh, administer, uh, uh, they miss some words or they give underdose. So um, some words may be having very low titers, they are actually always susceptible. So this is, uh, uh, even though it is a persistent infection in the uh, farm, but still if there is a uniform titers and uh, required protective titers, that will really help. So with this, I thank uh, both the speakers uh, for their excellent uh, presentation. And we hope in the future also some more topics we'll inv invite uh, them for uh, other uh, practical aspects because this is very important. Uh, um, thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. And maybe I request uh, uh, our other office bearers, uh, Dr. Munia Passar, uh, anybody would like to further share their views, sir? Okay, if not, uh, then, uh, you know, it's time for uh, inviting Dr. Gaukare, sir, uh, the Vice President of AHP, uh, for offering the vote of thanks, please. Hello. That's yeah, Dr. Munipa, sir, we, we can, uh, uh, you can unmute and you can share, sir. Dr. Munipa, sir, if you are speaking, then um, you need to unmute, sir. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you now, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. And both these speakers, they are really, they are enlightened about their respective topics and it is very uh, interesting. And uh, I just, I want to supplement uh, with regard to IBH. IBH uh, definitely it is a endemic, both uh, in the commercial broilers as well as the commercial layers. And uh, uh, what I could uh, see the desired erosion uh, mostly, sometimes it is also uh, the wizard erosion, probably due to uh, the, the fungus may be involved in that. Uh, we have seen uh, good results uh, whenever there is such uh, combined lesions uh, giving copper sulfate in the water for three days. Uh, the, the mortality we can uh, drastically we can reduce. That is one of uh, I mean the one suggestions I can make here, and at the same time, as you know that uh, this is adenovirus, it is a immunosuppressive in nature. Now we are seeing uh, the RD lesions also, in addition to the uh, liver lesions and the lizard erosion. Uh, it is also uh, coming out with the combined infection of RD also. So accordingly, we may have to design some uh, strategy for the control and containment of the infections. So these are the two points I can add. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, these are really indeed uh, great value additions, what you shared for the deliberation. Now I move to Dr. Gaukar, sir, to uh, express the vote of thanks on behalf of the team, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vijay and uh, all the speakers. On behalf of the organizing team of the AHP. Uh, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks to on this occasion. My heart is with uh, lots of gratitude and respect for our distinguished speakers, Dr. Sudhir Yukadikar, who has been working along with me since long, and Dr. Jayandesh Pandey also. He's a very uh, eminent uh, personality in the field of his poultry health. and uh, he has been working since long, so we have got the opportunity to hear both of them. And uh, uh, I thank both of them, not only not only for sparing their valuable time, but uh, for their uh, okay by gracing this occasion and enlightening us with their commandable talk with the, uh, in their respective subjects. Thanks a lot, a lot, both of you, sir, Dr. Rukhtika and Dr. Jain Deshpande. By clearing our concepts and enhancing our understanding pertaining to the winter management as well as the IBH management also. You both have indeed put the best of your efforts to make this event unforgettable, 
really we are highly obliged with your presentation many thanks to our august participants who has attended this webinar uh, in, in respect of their uh, uh, their daily routine and showing their interest and interact with these uh, speakers to get more knowledge on this important topic of the poultry health thank you thanks a lot of well friend an event like this cannot happen overnight the wheels rolling weeks ago it requires planning and a bird's view for details we have been fortunate enough to back by the team leaders like dr kataria dr mrd dr d dr makija dr kanaki dr muliappa dr nagaraja dr chabra and so many thanks a lot once upon once and all thanks very much thank you dr gaukar sir uh, on behalf of the team for expressing the vote of thanks uh, i also like to recognize uh, dr kanaki's comments on the ibs so dr kanaki namaswami thank you so much for sharing your observation on the uh, detailed uh, ibs topic uh, on the chat box thanks that was very enlightening and i really appreciate uh, the feedback shared by the members on the futuristic topic for the, our webinar so we have made a note on the improving the technical information on hatchery vaccination and also uh, there is a appeal that uh, a dedicated session on the health and disease management regard to ducks so these two suggestions have come and we really appreciate uh, you you contributing these topics uh, for the future uh webinars and this is also open forum like any further topic please write to us reach out to any one of us uh, we will be more than happy to assess those topics uh, for the larger interest of the our members so with this um, uh, i being your host and we have uh, done wonderful in terms of time management so uh, we are finishing in time thank you so much and on the occasion of the birth anniversary of swami vivekanand ji i i express that you know uh we keep on focusing on our work till the goal is reached and the goal is to ensure the sustainable food supply through chicken and egg production thank you so much and wish you a very uh, good day ahead thank you thank you thank you thank you so much thank, thank you sir you. thank you everybody thank you sir so i thank uh, dr gokare for sir and also makija for taking up this thing i mean model moderator as well as uh, uh, anchoring this uh, webinar sir always a pleasure to work with you sir always <laughs> thank you thank you thank you dr oklika sir thank you dr deshpa everybody bye thank you sir